All right, good afternoon. I am Jennifer Troyer, Dean of the Belt College of Business at UNC Charlotte. I am pleased to welcome you to the North Carolina Economic Forecast today. So um, over the years, we have been thankful to our friends in the business community for providing essential funding for this event and for the research that underlies the presentation. So sponsors help us keep this quarterly event complimentary for students and alumni and members of the business community. So for sponsorship information, you can email us at belkrsvp at uncc.edu. If you have questions, please submit them via chat at any time throughout John's presentation, and we will have a question and answer period today following the presentation. For those of you who are on Twitter, you can join today's conversation by using hashtag NCForecast, and we look forward to seeing your tweets. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and our speaker, Dr. John Conadon, Professor of Financial Economics in the Belt College of Business. John joins the Belk College faculty in 1978 and became director of the economic forecast in 1981. And the first quarterly presentation of the economic forecast was done 40 years ago um, in December of 1982. So for over 40 years, John's been interpreting the data and sharing his insights about where North Carolina's economy has been and where he thinks it's going next. So um, I know we're all looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. Now, let me see if I can get the technology working here. Ah, here we go. Uh, good afternoon to everybody, and thank you uh, for attending the uh, fourth quarter 2022 uh, North Carolina Economic Forecast. We've got a lot to do today. Uh, forecast presentation, uh, we'll start in just a second, and then we'll at 1245. Hopefully I'll be concluding it and we'll have a question and answer period. And please submit your any questions you have uh, to Dean Troyer uh, through chat. And uh, then we'll have about a 14 minute uh, period where I'll answer questions. And by one o'clock, uh, we will conclude our program. We've got a lot to do today. Uh, we only have five uh, headlines here, five things we're gonna look at, but we've got 60 slides to cover. So it's gonna be a pretty, pretty quick and we're gonna have to work pretty hard to get through it. So let's first of all, take a look at where we've been in, in 2022. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit, you, you'll notice here that we didn't have, this is our quarterly uh, North Carolina uh, real GDP growth levels. First quarter was up 2.8%. And that's very much in contrast to what we saw in the US where it was down by 1.6% in the first quarter. But we slipped a little in the second quarter, not quite as bad. And we expect the third and fourth quarter when all the data are in to have modest growth during the year. But overall, primarily based on this in the fourth quarter of 2021, we expect the overall growth rate to be about 3.4% this year. I know a lot of folks were concerned when they saw two quarters of decline in the US GDP in the uh, in first and second quarter of 2022. Uh, that maybe we're slipping in a recession. We've got a whole session, section on that a little bit later on in the presentation. But the fact of the matter is um, there was no recession in 2022. We had a little bit of a bumpy road in the, in the second quarter, but that's pretty much it. Looking at all of the sectors, and for those of you that are first time viewers, first of all, welcome. Thank you for attending. But let me explain this chart a little bit. This is sort of a combination of a bar chart for growth and a pie chart to give you a sense as to how, how much each sector contributes to overall GDP. So if we look at the horizontal axis here, like if we look at uh, business and professional services, we look at the horizontal axis, it grew by 11.2% in real terms, and it makes up about 15.4% of, of uh, GDP. So the size of these rectangles really gives you an indication as to how much each sector contributed to economic growth. And you see in 2000, in 22, we had a real mixed bag here in terms of some sectors growing and some sectors shrinking. Uh, but if you look at the sectors that are shrinking here, when you look at construction, durable, and non-durables, these are all sectors that are reasonably impacted by rising interest rates, which started uh, early in uh, or in the spring of 2022 and have been getting uh, consistently higher throughout the year. Um, and that's really put a damper on, on some of these uh, manufacturing and construction industries. On a, on a job sense, though, it's been a great year. 162,000 jobs 
We don't have the December numbers in yet, but um, it's going to be real hard not to get to 160,000 jobs when, when the December numbers finally come in. Um, every sector, no matter whether GDP was growing in that sector or not, every sector experienced job growth in 2022. Overall, employment growth was 3.9%. A lot of this is catch up. A lot of this is catch up to what happened two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, and so it's, it, you know, it kind of is inconsistent with what we saw in terms of the GDP side where we had five or six sectors actually shrink during 2022. In 2023, um, I know we're going to have a conversation uh, today, um, both in the presentation and probably afterwards about the prospects of recession in 23. Um, and, but before we do that, I'm kind of well, going to let the cat out of the bag here. And you'll see that we're expecting all four quarters to experience growth overall, just a 1.2%, kind of a modest growth, a little bit below our 2.5% uh, annual, typical annual growth rate. So not quite as strong. So there'll be a little bit of a slowdown. But right now, we don't really see that there'll be a recession um, in 2023, given the current information that we have. Um, there will, however, be, again, some ups and some downs in terms of the sectors, uh, construction and non-durable goods. Uh, again, interest sensitive. Uh, we'll see those. But on the services side, uh, we see nothing but uh, growth in, in terms of service sectors. And, uh, you know, that's part of the shift that consumers are making from being, uh, during COVID, buying a lot of goods because uh, they were spending a lot of time at home. And now uh, that they can get out and they put COVID behind them, they're actually engaging in purchasing a lot of services and experiences. And we see that taking place. Uh, not just in 2022, but also in 2023. We expect that to continue. Job side, you'll see that uh, we're probably about less than half as many jobs will be created. Uh, part of that is the slowing in the economy down to 1.2%. But also part of that is simply the fact that we, we have labor shortages and we, we are basically pushing the envelope, if you will, in terms of the available employees out there um, we've, we've kind of made back all of the jobs that we wound up losing uh, because of COVID issues. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult going forward for us to generate those 90 and 100,000 uh, net new jobs per year levels, uh, given the demographics, both in the U.S. and in the state. So we're, we're expecting the uh, employment growth to be a little bit more modest in 2023, uh, although most, all sectors will still, regardless of how they're doing on the output side, we expect all sectors to basically still try to backfill positions going forward. Uh, as far as the unemployment rate is concerned, uh, right now uh, we're sitting at right at 3.8%, a tenth of a percent higher uh, unemployment rate than the U.S. Uh, we expect to see it dip a little bit at the first of the year, but rise a little throughout the year as job growth slows down a little bit. Um, and we expect to be about 4. Point, uh, excuse me, about 3.9% at the end of December, of, of December 2023. Uh, so you know, if you look at this unemployment number, uh, it's pretty hard to uh, visualize a, reception, a recession without seeing unemployment rates go up, particularly when they're down below 4%, uh, which we think is sort of the benchmark rate for full employment. Um, and we're gonna be there at least to the first half of the year and probably the second half of, the, of 2023 as well. All right. so. Recovery came rather quickly. Um, within two years of the COVID recession taking place, uh, the GDP was almost 5% higher than it was before we went in. Uh, we had 50, over 50,000 more jobs, and only the unemployment rate uh, two years on was a little bit higher. And now, as you see, uh, by uh, November of 2022, uh, the unemployment rate is at 3.8%, basically the same as when we started this whole thing um, back in December of 2019. So the 23 outlook, we've got some known knowns. We've got continuing supply chain issues. Those don't seem to be going, going away anytime soon. We've got inflation issues. Um, yes, inflation is slowing, but it's still historically at historically high levels. Uh, we'll speak a little bit about the in inflation and where, where it has been and where we see it going uh, over the next year in, ju in just a minute. Um, we have continued deficit spending. It's not as bad as it was at the height of the pandemic, but uh, we're still running 
over trillion dollar budget deficits for the foreseeable future. Um, and we have household savings levels uh, starting to decline and get back to normal levels. And so households have continued or have been able to spend out basically all of the uh, pent up uh, savings that they had during COVID when savings were building and also uh, most of the stimulus checks that they received. We've got some known unknowns. We still have the UK Ukrainian problem and the energy issue surrounding that, that war in Ukraine. Um, the Fed balance sheet is really kind of an interesting thing. We'll, we'll speak uh, to that in, in just a couple of seconds. But we have Fed tapering, which is their stop purchasing new issues, which they have done. Uh, but now they're entering a phase where they're engaging in quantitative tightening. We all heard of quantitative easing uh, during both the 2008 and 9 recession and also during the COVID recession. Uh, but now we're starting to see the Fed do quantitative tightening. That's a new tool that they have, and that's a tool that uh, we'll take a look at and see how, they're, see how they're doing on that front. And then finally, uh, one of the known unknowns is we know that interest rates are going to rise, but we really don't. We're really unsure what's going to happen next week when the Fed meets, um, and also in the eight meetings that are, that, that are going to come up uh, in 2023. We don't know. There is speculation that they may stop and pause for a, a quarter or so to see how what they've already done impacts has impacted the economy. And these are things we just don't know. And these are the uncertainties, if you will. And then finally, we don't have it down here, but of course there are unknown unknowns, as we all know, and we don't even know what those are that could wind up affecting what's going on. Okay, so let's take a look at Fed and in, in in inflation uh, during the last uh, basically uh, two years. Um, here we start back in January of, of 20, and we see you know modest, what we've been experiencing for the last 30 plus years which is modest inflation somewhere in the one to 2% range, uh, which is clearly within the guideline that the Federal Reserve had set for themselves uh, in terms of price stability, one of their dual mandates. And then all of a sudden with all the stimulus checks uh, in 2021, we see, the start, we see this start to take off. Again, in 22, it, it continues on um, in 22. Peak on, uh, inflation rate was 9.1% in the summer. I think it was June of 2022. Uh, right now, our most recent one uh, is was 7.7%. That's for October. The November number will come out next week. I believe it comes out on Tuesday. Uh, the Fed meets, by the way, on Tuesday and Wednesday morning. Uh, so they will, while they're meeting, they will receive what the uh, November inflation rate is. Expectations are it's going to be probably 7.5%. We'll speak a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, types of inflation, we've gone through this. For those that have been here before, you've seen these. We have demand pull, we have cost push. These are fairly self-explanatory, but we also have inflationary expectations, and that's when households and businesses expect prices to increase. Then they're much more pliant in terms of accepting them and pushing them forward in case of businesses. Um, and we're in that phase right now. We still have, we've, the Fed is working on slowing down the demand pull side of inflation. But cost side, cost push sides are still problems, particularly because of the supply chain, and as we'll see in a minute, also wages. Um, so the, the inflationary pressures we have had to, got us into this inflationary spiral. We've had a, a pretty significant domestic spending uh, with deficits uh, as much as three trillion in some years. Federal uh, budget deficits. We've had stimulus checks go out uh, to uh, eighty percent of households. We've had enhanced unemployment payments, payroll protection, child care credit that's been instituted and increased recently. And we have something called the SNAP benefit, which is the old uh, food stamp program, uh, supplemental nutritional program. Um, and the benefit, there's been a benefit upgrade um, that's taken place this year, which means that the SNAP benefits are even higher than they had been in the past. Um, here's our look at our budget deficits. Uh, you know, basically from 2000. This is the peak of the budget deficit, if you will. Um, this is zero right here, by the way. And this is back in 2000 when we actually ran a budget surplus. I know most of you don't remember that. And, uh, it's kind of ancient history. But here at the peak of the Great Recession, we ran a budget deficit of just under a trillion and a half dollars. Uh, in this recession, which lasted two months and basically was over um, in a year, 
we were at a three trillion budget deficit. And now that we're, you know, two years past the pandemic, we're still run, running buff, a budget deficit uh, in this fiscal year, this past fiscal year, um, that's almost as, as big as the budget deficits we ran at the peak of the Great Recession. And, and these don't seem to be ending if, you know, we look out at the forecast by the CBO, these they tend to go out kind of like this um, in the next couple of years. Um, and on the cost side, cost push side, we've got the declining labor force participation rates and shifting demographics, extended supply chains, which aren't working. And of course, the problems with China as they they move from zero COVID policy to who knows what in the next few months. Uh, but that really up disrupts our supply chain for a lot of a wide range of products that we rely on China for inputs. Uh, we've had expanded regulations under the Biden administration, which have shot costs up for companies. We've had COVID issues in the past. We may have them in the future. It's unclear. And of course, we've had some energy spikes. Right now, energy prices are fine, but uh, we went through a summer where they were well over $100 per barrel for oil. All right, so here we have the labor force participation rate all the way back to January of 76. And we can see it kind of rising as baby boomers entered the workforce um, and uh, labor force participation rose. Uh, since the beginning of this uh, century, we've seen uh, labor force participation rates decline. And this is really starting to see the baby boomers uh, begin retiring. And here we have an interesting fact. We saw a big decline during COVID We've gone back up again to about 62.3%. But if you carry this forward, um, you can imagine that, you know, we're about where we would have been but for COVID at this point in time. So the idea that there's some kind of recovery that's likely to take place from COVID, um, or now that COVID is over and people will start to re-enter the labor force, um, is highly unlikely that it's going to have a significant, significant impact on this level of labor force participation. Um, and the reason for it is really very, very simple. Uh, this is from the 2020 census. These are five-year age cohorts and how many people are in here. And these are millions of people. So we've got 20,800,000 um, people that in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2020 were uh, 60 to 64. These are the baby boomers who are starting to retire, okay? And they are being replaced by the 15 to 19 year olds. And there are almost 21 million of them. So you see, that's a, almost a one for one here. But in the next round, in the next five years, what we're going to start to see is sort of the peak of baby boomers. There are 21.6 million of those. They're going to start retiring, and there's only 20.75 million um, that will then be of age to replace them. And so you can start to see that labor force participation rates are going to continue to go down. And the problem is that, you know, these folks right here, they are in both the uh, numerator and the denominator, okay, right now while they're working. All right, and I, that while they are 16 years of age or older, these folks are not in there. They're not in the numerator or the denominator. These folks are, some of them are in both, uh, but most are only in uh, the uh, denominator. What's gonna happen is when these folks leave the numerator, okay, they stay in the denominator. These come in and they enter the numerator and the denominator. You can see where this is going without having to have an advanced degree in mathematics. Compare this to 40 years ago, and you saw 10 million people leaving the labor force by retiring, and you had 21 million entering, baby boomers, right? And then you had, five years later, you had 11.6 million leaving, you had 18.2 entering. So you can start to see that this is quite a bit different set of demographics than we had um, back during the 80s, the 90s, and, in, and into the early 2000s. And so we really have some labor force issues that we really should be starting to address. All right, um, this is kind of the oil price spike that we talked about and on the, on the um, cost push side in terms of resources. It spiked here um, this summer uh, around June at, at 114 barrels for West Texas uh, Intermediate. And now it's down, uh, as I say, to $87. Um, and seems to be stabilizing at about that point. Now that is, a lot higher still than the $60 barrel that we seem to have for quite some time uh, during the last half a dozen years prior to COVID, okay? COVID, of course, cost the price to go down dramatically and it's been rising ever since, uh, but it seems to be going down. Question obviously is, 
A lot of this has got to do with some increased supplies, but most of it has to do with, and I know there wasn't a lot, but just a million barrels a day being released from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, uh, you know, just in the margins, million barrels here, a million barrels there, and it has an impact on price, okay? All right, confusing Fed jargon going forward. Oh, goodness. The Fed is, they talk about inflation, but they've got a lot of terms that they use. And I just thought it would be a good idea if we talked about some of these so that as you start to interpret what the Fed is saying, you have a better understanding of what they're thinking about. So they use terms like short run inflationary expectations, long run inflationary expectations, inflation anchoring, and what's called a neutral rate. So let's see if we can understand what each of these are. But first, I always fav favorite quote, is from Milton Friedman in 63, which says inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And I don't, I think we need to keep that in mind and, and going forward. And that's why the Fed becomes so important here in fighting inflation. And here we have um, sort of the monetary phenomena. Something the Fed did during the pandemic um, was they basically created uh, M1, essentially the same as what was M2. M the reason that, um, so the blue line here is M1, the red line is M2. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a definition of money supply. The difference between is the ability of the uh, accounts, like checking accounts, savings accounts to be converted to cash. And what they did was they made it a much easier for money market accounts, for time deposits, et cetera, to be easily converted to cash during the pandemic, which made sense because you wanted people to have access to all of their savings because we didn't know how bad this was going to be. And so you saw the M1 shoot up to basically be almost the same as M2, but they haven't changed that policy. And so what we have is an incredible growth in the most liquid form of money. Um, and that speaks to Milton Friedman's uh, previous quote, okay? So let's take a look at inflationary expectations are simply the rate at which people, consumers, businesses, investors expect prices to rise in the future. And this matters because actual inflation depends in part on what we expect it to be. That's that expectations component that I mentioned, demand pull, cost push, inflationary expectations. So all we're looking at is what people, consumers, businesses, and investors expect, expect prices to be in the future, both in the short run and in the long run. So that's inflationary expectations. The Cleveland Fed, actually does the, the, uh, the surveys on this to get a sense of this. I'm, we, I just quickly pulled this off the, the Fed, in, uh, the, the Cleveland Fed, and you can see that right now in a five year, this is a five year forward inflationary expectation survey. And you can see five year forwards, the bound here is between two and 3% with one little exception here. The, when the interest rate hit about, uh, when the inflation rate hit about uh, 9% in the summer, but it's come back down again to between two and 3%. So people's inflationary expectations right now, their five year forward inflationary expectations are quite modest, okay? But keep this in mind of where it is, despite seeing inflation rise dramatically during most of the year. And look at this, this is lower than it was back here in 2012, 2014, et cetera. Okay, inflation anchoring, what does that term mean? So the term anchoring means relatively insensitive to incoming data. So what it means is inflationary expectations are relatively insensitive to the current data that we have today. So if the public experiences a spell of inflation that's higher than their long run expectation, which we've been experiencing for the last year and a half, but their long term expectation of inflation changes little as a result, then the inflation expectations are considered to be well anchored. And that's what we're seeing right here. You would expect people to think that, hey, we're seeing seven, eight percent rates of inflation, and we've been seeing them now for the last six or eight months. You would think that people would say, hmm, I see this data that my expectations about future inflation rates five years down the road are going to be higher, yet they really changed very little during this period of time. So you would have to say that the that people, businesses, consumers, investors all have fairly anchored inflationary expectations. Okay. And then finally, the neutral rate. Now, in theory, the neutral interest rate is the rate at which monetary policy is neither stimulative or restrictive in economic growth. And it's a rate that keeps output growing around its potential rate at full employment. The Fed talks about this a lot, but how does the Fed know what it is? Well, it really doesn't, but it tries to estimate it. And right now, um, 
it's pegged to, you know, the, it, it currently stands at about two and a half percent, which may suggest that the current federal funds rate may in fact be contractionary because it's, it's, it's pushing 4% right now, which would say that it is above the two and a half percent rate, the natural rate, if you will, uh, for the federal funds rate uh, that would be neither that would be neither expansionary or contractionary in nature. So these are all important because this is this is the way the Fed thinks about what it is they're doing. They think about inflationary expectations, both short term and long term. They think uh, they think about inflationary ex, uh, anchor anchoring, if you will, and they think about what the what the neutral rate is and where they are relative to the neutral rate. These are the things that go into their considerations. Um, so what we have here is kind of a graph, if you will, of the 1970s. We start back here in 69. Uh, the, the CPI is the orange line. The blue line is the federal funds rate. And you can see that during the, the 70s, when we had on average over a 7% year in, year out average rate of inflation, um, you can see that the and you see it's all between five and 10% or with a few exception of a few spikes. Um, these things tend to track together, not terribly different in terms of the, the, the federal funds rate, excuse me, being above the CPI. It gets here, turns it down and they immediately address it by letting the rate fall. And then it starts back up again and they chase the rate back up. And then this is 1979 when Volcker first tried to do something. And then this again is in 1980 and 81 where he really got serious, pushed the rates way above the consumer price index. Consumer price index fell well below 5% by mid 82 and has been in that two to 3% range max for the next 40 years until the current period that we're in. All right, here's where we are now. This is the CPI during most of the COVID years. Um, and we've raised it up to where the effective rate is 3.81% or something along those lines. But we're still looking at 7.7% uh, inflation rate. Um, if you can just kind of visualize this rate continuing down and this rate continuing up, it's kind of like what you're not supposed to do in, uh, in uh, you, you know, in, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want the streams to cross, if you will, and Ghostbusters. I, I think that's the, what I'm looking for here. But that's what the Fed's hoping for. They hope they can start to mitigate this. This will fall below the federal funds rate, and they'll meet somewhere in the middle where the federal funds rate won't go much past 5% and be terribly contractionary or restrictive. That's what they're hoping for. But we, we, we know that this doesn't necessarily follow nice trends consistently. So where does Jerome Powell stand in all of this? So this was uh, out of a Cato speech that took place in the third quarter of this year, I think it was September. And Powell noted uh, that one of the lessons that, that the Fed has learned, but I think we could say he has learned from the period of inflation that former chair Paul Volcker inherited is that failing to bring inflation down when you start to fight it only entrenches inflation expectations, which in turn, in turn makes it harder to get it under control. The prior record of failed attempts to control inflation resulted in higher cost of bringing that inflation down again. And we go back to this. This is what he's talking about. We tried and tried, but we were never serious about it. We got serious about it here, and we had a very, very severe recession in 82 that uh, uh, the unemployment rate peaked at over 10%. So that's, that's essentially what Powell is talking about right here. He doesn't want to relive the experiences of the 70s where we kept fighting it, but we never really nipped it, if you will. Okay, so I, why I think everybody signed up to take a look at this today, and that is, what's the prospects of recession in, in, in 2023? Well, um, five decades of recession, all right? So it goes back to my first recession as an economist, which is in, in uh, 1974 and five when I was in graduate school. Um, and uh, the duration there was a it was a pretty significant recession. Uh, unemployment rate reached over 10%, 16 months of duration. You can see that we had a real short one in 80 when the Fed again tried to deal with inflation, but man, it was not really playing full on. But when um, Volcker really decided to end it, it was in 82, another long, deep recession. A couple of mild recessions in the 90s and again in the 2000s. 
<clears throat> excuse me, I just want you to look over here. Look at these uh, length of expansions that we had coming out of that Volcker led stamping down, if you will, of inflation. 92 months of uninterrupted growth. Mild recession lasted eight months. 120 months of economic growth. Then we had, unfortunately, the housing bubble. We had a pretty significant great recession, lasted 18 months. Again, 10% rate of unemployment. After that, was 73 months. Um, excuse me. After I'm excuse me. After the after the 70 uh, after the 2001 recession, we had 73 months. And then after the Great Recession, we had 128 months, uh, which is the longest expansion on record until the COVID recession, which only lasted two months. Uh, peak unemployment rate, though, was pretty significant, 14 over 14 percent. All right, so um, here are the causes. Can I keep this in mind? Arab oil embargo caused the, the 74 5 recession, the Iranian revolution and oil issues, and to some extent, Fed policy of raising interest rates caused the 80. Obviously, Fed caused the Fed pol the interest rates reaching federal funds rate in 82 reached 19.1%. I want to repeat that 19.1%. Um, so that basically caused a severe uh, 82 recession. The recession of 91, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, and again, oil and some Fed policy. Dot com bubble in 2001, and a little bit of Fed policy or lack thereof. Um, we had gas prices. This wasn't an embargo, but gas prices for the first time reached over $4 a gallon in the summer of 2007. That put us into a recession. Then the housing bubble was the second shoe to fall um, in the summer and fall of 2008, which caused a very, very severe recession. And then finally, COVID-19, uh, the two-month recession um, in 2020. So was there a recession in 2022? A lot of people say yes, because we had that two consecutive quarters of downturn in GDP. Well, here's the problem with that. <clears throat> the National Bureau of Economic Research has a business cycle dating committee, um, and they look at five things to determine whether or not uh, we are in a recession and whether they should call a recession starting point and a recession ending point. And if you look at these five things, what you see is, oh my goodness, GDP doesn't show up there at all. They look at non-farm payroll, real PCE, which is personal consumption expenditures, wholesale and retail trade, real, 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 excuse me, real sales, real sales levels, not inflated sales levels, <clears throat> household survey employment, and industrial production. So let's take a look at these. Well, here's your GDP numbers. This is what everybody wants to say. Oh, two quarters in a row, we had a recession. Well, the third quarter was 2.9%. This fourth quarter is yesterday's. Um, the Atlanta Fed does a GDP tracker, and every week they update that as to what they expect GDP to be in that quarter. It's been pretty darn accurate over the last few years. Um, so their update yesterday was that the fourth quarter GDP this year for the U.S. should be about 3.4% growth. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit in a few seconds. Okay, let's say I got 10 minutes to go. I think I'm going to make it here. Um, We'll talk about this as it relates to our ability to fight inflation with 2.9% and 3.4% growth rates at the end after interest rates have risen substantially during the third and fourth quarter. All right, so <clears throat> here is the, the uh, U.S. unemployment rates through, the, through this year. And during the first and second quarter, while lots of folks said, well, G GDP is negative, we should see, we should have a recession. We should be saying we're in a recession, but how can you do that while during that time we see the unemployment rate fall from 4% in January down to 3.6% in June at the end of the second quarter? You cannot have, you cannot call a, a recession while you have declining unemployment rates. And while they've risen here in the last couple of months, they're still well below the 4% benchmark rate that we consider to be kind of the threshold for full employment. All right, let's take a look at non-farm payroll. And oh my goodness, these are 149 million in January and each and every month the payroll has gone up. And if I do my math correctly, that's like 4 million jobs this year. Pretty hard to argue that we've had a recession while we've almost been consistently and linearly adding jobs uh, to the tune of 4 million of them uh, through this year. Uh, wholesale and retail real sales 
have been a little bouncy, as you can see here, uh, during the year. But still, during those first two uh, quarters, been pretty much consistently going up if you kind of average this thing out. And they've dropped in the third and fourth quarter. Um, but again, not, not significantly. And, and I want you to pay attention to this scale because it only goes from $490 billion to $506 billion. So this is not a big drop. This is a drop of you know $5 billion. That's it um, over the past four or five months. That's not exactly a big trough, if you will, in terms of sales. Here's the real personal consumption expect expenditures in billions of dollars during this year. Again, with the exception of July, uh, pretty much consistently going up. Uh, it's currently standing at $14 trillion. And then finally, industrial production. Uh, we see that rising through the first half of the year, kind of leveling off here um, in June and July. And then again, stepping up uh, for the third and into uh, th through October. Um, so, you know, when you look at all these things together, you have to ask yourself a question. It sure doesn't look like the things that the, that the, the NBER business cycle dating committee look at would have, would provide any indication that they would want to suggest that we were in a recession, uh, during 2022 at any point in time. Um, and, oh, one last thing is they also like to look at the household survey employment, which is a little different from the establishment employment level that we were all that we're all used to, because this includes self-employed people in, in addition to that. And while it, it hasn't, it's been kind of choppy, but this is a small survey compared to the establishment survey, which I showed you earlier. Um, and so it's not unlike it for it's not it's not inconsistent for it to be choppy like this and not mean a whole lot. But, you know, during the year, we see, again, we've added uh, a million jobs and at the household level, that's inconsistent with a recession happening. All right, so let's talk about recession uncertainty in 2023. Um, consumer confidence is an issue. Continuing expanding supply chain uh, issues are, are problematic. Uh, there's a little bit of hope that China is moving away from their zero tolerance policy, but they're still going to be clamping down much, much more on COVID issues than uh, we do in this country or that they do in Europe. Inflation is still a problem. <clears throat> we've, got a, we've got an issue potentially down the road in 23 called wage catch up. I'll explain that in just a second. We talk about household savings levels, Fed interest rate policy, Fed tapering and quantitative tightening, deficit spending, Europe, Ukraine, soft, all of these things, all of these things are going to have an impact on what happens in 2022. So let's roll through them real quick. We can see that looking at the uh, University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment uh, Survey, uh, we've seen consumers, you know, declining during most of this year in terms of their comfortability of what they expect next. Right now, it's at 59.9. That's, that's pretty low, to be quite honest with you. Um, that is a little bit concerning. Um, their next number comes out at the uh, middle of the month, so we'll see what's going on there. Here is the consumer price index. Uh, we're sitting at 7.7%. Um, most of it's so already baked in. The expectation here for November and December when these numbers come out is they're gonna be 7.5 to 7.6%, even if we only see inflation increased by modestly by a 4% annualized rate in November and December. They're still going to be quite high because so much has been baked in already. The, the, the inflation numbers are already so high that when you look at it year over year, it's very difficult to see it being less than 7.5%. Um, this is the wage kept catch up problem. So since August of 2020, when kind of COVID got over, um, we've seen the consumer price index rise by 15%, but wages only rise by just a little over 11%. That's a 4% difference. What it means is today, on average, consumers are 4% poorer, if you will, or able to buy 4% less stuff uh, than they were you know, 18 months ago. And there's going to be a wage catch up, particularly with these type labor markets. Um, and so we're going to continue to see from the production side of things, uh, wage increases pushing up uh, uh, company costs, um, and you know it's it, what some people like to talk about the wage price cycle. But this is just wage price, wage pressure on 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 prices, um, and we've seen recently with the railroad workers and with the airline uh, pilots 
we've seen some dramatic increases in wages, uh, wage concessions uh, to these to these unions over the next uh, several years uh, to try to make it this to try to adjust for this wage catch up. Um, household savings levels, you see they peaked here in the middle of 2020. That's because the companies kept sending you paychecks, but you couldn't go out and spend it, okay? Uh, and then we had a series of stimulus checks. And uh, right now, as you can see, we bled them down. So on one side, on the demand side of uh, the inflation, uh, we're starting to see households actually get fairly tight on their savings levels, i.e. their ability to use savings to continue these purchases. Um, but I'm, I'm remiss to say that this is going to be a significant impact on consumer expenditures going forward, primarily because I'm pretty sure that given the experience of COVID, um, consumer behavior has changed a little bit. And I suspect they're going to wind up putting a lot of expenditures and experiences, particularly services, travel, et cetera, going forward uh, on credit cards to be for perfectly comfortable increasing their debt levels. Uh, the interest rate decisions the Fed has made this year, they didn't do anything in the January meeting, excuse me, in the last uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven meetings, six meetings, they've raised, we've gone from 25 basis points to 50 and then four of 75. Smart money now on the next one has it at 50. We'll know on Wednesday afternoon at two o'clock what they did. Uh, but right now the smart money has it on 50. What this has done is take the... Um, federal funds rate from basically zero to 25 basis points uh, up now where at the end of this year, it'll be, if they do 50, it'll be between four and a half and 475. Uh, it's clearly above the, what the Fed thinks the, the, their neutral rate is. Um, and it's, it's, it's significant enough that the expectations are that in early 23, the Fed is going to pause uh, and because there is an impact lag of monetary policy that's as much as six months, maybe as much as nine, some suggest. And they're going to wait and see for a few months to see what all of these increases have had on the economy so they don't go too far. All right. If it doesn't mean they're done. So the current federal funds target is 3.75 to 4%. It's going to be 4.5. The, the December inflation expectations are going to be the seven to seven and a half. It's really going to, this is the meeting I think that's really going to tell us what's really going on uh, for 2023. And that's the February 1 meeting. If there's a pause or a slowing to say 25 basis points, um, that's going to suggest that the Fed is pretty much done for the short term on interest rates. If these set of rates so far haven't made a big impact on slowing the economy down, it doesn't look like the first half of the year they're going to do much. Uh, this is the Fed balance sheet. As you can see, uh, they've not only started tapering, which is reducing the levels of buying assets, but they're now basically contracting or tightening, you, you, uh, engaging in quantitative tightening um, by actually selling off some of these. Without getting into a lot of gobbledygook about what their plan is, um, they're basically looking at a, a maximum of, of, of a quantitative tightening of about 95 billion on their balance sheet. That's a cap per month, um, which it, we'll see what's going on here. If, if we look at what's happened since the balance sheet peaked at over 8.9 or about roughly 8.9 trillion, they pulled it down to, um, to um, 8.5 trillion or almost 8.6 trillion. So the actual decline has been about $330 billion but the cap decline could have been 427 based on um, the 47 and a half billion cap of, of adjustment in June and August. And then since August, they can do 95 a billion. So they're not as aggressive on quantitative tightening um, as they have suggested they could be. All right, um, here's our budget deficit. You've seen this slide before. Um, and the good news is uh, you can see that in, since 2000, um, the recessions have really slowed or decreased in length tremendously. So even if we have a recession, it's likely to be quite mild. And, and I don't really see another 10% unemployment rate. It, the worst case scenario um, is probably 5 to 6% rate of unemployment. All right. So some key takeaways today. First of all, energy matters. Energy shocks matter, particularly exogenous ones. When it drove the price of oil up over $100 a barrel, 
Um, it had impact on uh, our budgets, and it also had impact on cost for uh, moving products, making products, et cetera. Fed policy matters going forward, they're resolved. Uh, we've got demand side versus supply side inflation. Um, the wealth effect as the stock market corrects. And I, you know, I'm, I wrote this slide two days ago, 50-50 recession chance in 2023. Um, I may be down to 33, 67% uh, today. So I'm not really uh, bullish, excuse me, uh, uh, bearish on the chances of recession going forward. Real quick, I'm not going to go through all these. These are some things for you to look at uh, coming up December 14th. We'll get the November inflation number. Uh, uh, to December 9th, a couple of days from now, we'll get the consumer sentiment number. Um, we've got to get the first, we've just got the, the November number. We'll get it the December number, the first Friday of uh, January, and then the fourth quarter GDP, uh, very important number, uh, January 26th. So again, I want to thank you all for attending. And now we've got, I can see already on the chat, we've got 20 questions. So I'm going to turn this over to Jennifer. She's going to try to put them together to answer as many questions as you all have. And thank you for your attention. I you know I've been talking fast and I apologize. Jennifer, take over. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> great. So I tell you, we've gotten some great questions, John. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. Um, if you have questions, you can still enter them into the chat. We'll see if we have time to get the, to them today. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off. We had several questions related to the labor force. Um, so let me let me start with one focused on North Carolina. So um, interested in delving into what's happening in the technology sector, particularly in North Carolina. Overall, the tech sector employment continues to increase, but recently there's been a slowing of job openings. Um, also, there's been the, there have been headlines of large tech worker layoffs. Um, so what's happening here and how ought workers and companies be thinking about this moving into 2023? Right. So far, we really haven't seen that affect our tech sector in this state, like what's happening in California. Um, we're not as much R&D and much more manufacturing and, and much less research, much more development and manufacturing in terms of our, our, tech, sir, our tech sector here. Um, and so that's still, there's still a lot of demand for those products. Um, and I really haven't seen a big change. Now, a <clears throat> big impact. This is going to change going forward uh, because uh, the Apple announcement is purely a, a research center uh, that's up in the triangle. And that's going to employ as many as eight, nine, ten, maybe ten thousand people potentially. Or you know that that that's a big, big, big issue that will probably slow down its development. I don't think it's going to change it. Um, but our tech sector is in the process of changing in this state. And you know, right now, I think we're we're escaping. Um, the other good news is that, and and this goes back to tight labor force. Um, one of the reasons companies are moving here, particularly tech companies here and in Texas is it's easy to get recruit people to come here. Um, and the taxes are not bad. Yeah, we have a state income tax, but it's not a big one. Uh, property taxes are low here. Housing costs until the last year or so have been pretty reasonable here. And so all of those things mean it, it's fairly easy to get people to come here. And so if you're looking at really tight labor markets because of demographics, you wanna be someplace that's easy to get people to come to if you're trying to recruit. So, yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Um, sort of related to that um, question about policies to increase labor force participation. Um, this person posed sort of encur what encouraging later retirement, bringing in guest workers. Is there anything in particular that you have to say about that? Well, I'm not sure there's a lot you can do. And, and this is kind of got to be careful here. I may be answering a question on one of my finals uh, next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's okay if the students tuned in. If the students tuned in, good for them, right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what we have right now, one of the reasons interest rates, you know, we've got the Fed running interest rates up, okay? But yet we haven't seen U.S. Treasuries run up that much. We still have 10-year U.S. Treasuries at less than 4%. Less than, the, you know, less than the federal funds rate and clearly, you know, negative real rates. Why is that? Well, there's there's a savings glut, not just in this country, but in the world. 
And who is it that has all that savings glut? And it's people that are the baby boomers who are retiring. And so, you know, you have to ask yourself a question. How much of an incentive can you get or, or and, you know, can you get to make people who are wealthy, if you will, and don't need to work to live to go back into the labor force? So the, the real issue here is the only way we're going to get the labor force to grow, given the demographics. It's not like multiplicity, the movie, you can create already grown adults, all right? We're going to have to look at that idea of guest workers. We have that program with Canada already, uh, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, they're suffering the same kinds of problems we're suffering. But we're going to have to take a look at comprehensive uh, immigration reform. And we're going to have to we're going to have to do it as adults. I mean, this stuff that's going on the border, this doesn't help our problem. These are not people that are ready to come in here and fill the 10 million job openings that we have right now. Uh, that, that's a backlog. But we've we've got to get serious about immigration reform. We mm -hmm. have to. We have to. So related to baby boomers um, is a question about, you know, how concerned should we be about future demand for consumer goods? Um, is it the case that when individuals retire, you would expect them to tighten their purses a little bit? Um, that's, okay, it's a great question because, um, again, these folks are well off. I'm not sure they're going to have a, I don't think they're going to have a much significant decline in their, their level of purchases. But I think there's going to be a real big shift in their, what they, what they do spend their money on. And it's going to be experiences, travel experiences. This is a generation of retirees that are going to travel and put real pressure on the food service industry, the hospitality industry, the airlines, et cetera, which we've seen, you know, really struggle in the recovery from the pandemic anyway. And these are people that are going to continue to put pressure on that side of things. By the way, Jennifer, I just got a, I saw a chat come up where a former student of mine from 30 years ago says, yeah, I remember your finals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I awesome. No, that's okay. That's the time of year we're in, right? So, um, okay, I'm going to shift to debt. Um, you noted the escalating national debt during the pandemic. We're still pretty high. Um, what, you know, do you have any thoughts on on where that takes us next? Well, you know, we we've seen we've seen the debt increase for a couple of years of big deficits. And, you know, we've basically, we've, we've seen a debt increase by about $5 trillion in two years. So we went from the mid 20 trillion to over 30 trillion in, in debt. And if you look at the CBO projections in the next five years, we're gonna, add, we're gonna add another six or 7 trillion to that. You know, I don't know, and I'll be the, you know, first to admit this, I don't know when debt to GDP ratio becomes a problem, okay? Clearly right now we're at 125, 130% debt to GDP ratio. Uh, most European countries are under 100%, okay? But Japan is over 200% and they're still cooking along. And, you know, I, I, you, they're not the, the big economy that we are and the standard of living is not quite where we are, but they are clearly a first world country for sure. Um, and they, they're running a 200% debt to GDP ratio. So I'm not smart enough to know where that number is um, and where it starts to become a problem. Given, as we mentioned before, the incredible savings glut that we have, not just in this country, but worldwide, it does seem to be all that. I mean, again, we are selling 10-year treasuries to people at significantly negative interest rates. You know, three, four percent negative interest rates on ten-year treasuries. So, yeah, um, people are certainly willing to buy it. So, I don't know when it becomes a problem. Um, I, I, I don't know. So, this is a question that sort of relates to the recession and the Fed and inflation together. Um, so, do you you think that the Fed can tame inflation without us going into a real recession uh yes yes but not not having a recession or a significant slowdown i can i can conceive this is partly due to demographics by the way which were not in our favor back in the 70s and early 80s when we had con con contain inflation 
we had the exact opposite problem. We had growing labor force and we were trying to juice the economy to find jobs for people. And that was part of the problem in the 70s inflation. But because of the opposite problem here, I can conceive of an experience where the Fed gets inflation under control as long as they don't get soft in the first half of 23 and say, oh, let's pause for a while. Um, and then everybody thinks it's over and they start doing crazy things. But if they're, if they're strong and you know, Paul sticks to his Cato statement, I can conceive of seeing a slowdown mid-year uh, where we get to maybe one quarter negative growth, uh, maybe you know less than a percent for GDP growth for a quarter or two. We see the unemployment rate tick up to five, five and a half percent. Um, and then in 24 and 20, it's kind of stable in 24 and then in 25, we start to see growth again, pushing the unemployment rate down. I can conceive of that, but it's gonna take the Fed, in my estimation, I, I think there are two things that need to happen in order for that to, to take place. One, I, I think the Fed needs to be aggressive on the demand side of the economy and get rates up over 6%. I think that's one thing. I don't think that's, remember, the, the big recession came because we got interest rate, the federal funds rate up to 19.1%. So I, don't, I think six is enough to slow inflation down, but I don't think it's enough to, tum to tumble us into a 10% unemployment rate recession. But the second thing we've got to do is we've got to have some energy security here. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we need to keep prices below $80. 80 is not good enough. We need to keep prices below $80. That is the, that I think is the one other thing. That, and again, the Fed has no control over this. This is, this is a congressional and presidential issue. We cannot continue to tap the strategic reserve. While yes, there's still, you know, I forget what the number is, but about 60% of the maximum still in the reserve. You can't get all of that out, all right? And so, um, yeah, we've gotta be careful about that, but we really need to encourage drilling in this country, become energy independent again, um, and this is not a political talking point. This is just the reality that energy security, whether it comes from short-term drilling more or longer-term at alternative renewable resources that we have, um, th that stuff's got to go. I mean, that's got to happen. Um, and that will put more stability into the price side of things um, and, and help bring down inflation as well without a recession or a bad recession. So we're, we're coming up on one o'clock. So okay. we'll just have one more question. Hopefully. One more question. Short, All right. short one. Um, <clears throat> so why does the Fed think M2 doesn't matter anymore? Why does the Fed think what? That M2 doesn't matter anymore. Well, again, you have to understand why they did what they did. They did it to, so people could, you know, there was a rule about how, how often you could access your money market account in a month. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want that rule in April, May, and June of 2020, because people needed to be able to, you know, some people were losing their jobs. You know, unemployment rate went to 14.7%. We know that people needed to, to get at their savings. And so they, re, they removed those sets of rules, okay? Or they encouraged banks and money market companies to, 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 to limit those rules. So th that money became M1. But just like they, just like the same time they eliminated the reserve requirement, something we taught all our students for the mm -hmm. last 150, well, not that long, but, no, and, no. and they still haven't okay. backtracked on that yet. Neither one of those have they gone back on yet. Yeah, it'll be so interesting. That's a question that somebody should ask on Wednesday at uh, Mr. Powell's uh, press conference. Okay. When is the reserve requirement coming back in? And when are you going to have a distinction between M1 and M2? And I'm sorry that was a longer answer than. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you, John. Um, uh, thank you. Thank and I you thank everybody all. who attended. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, please make plans to join the next economic forecast and the release of the first quarter report in March 2023. We'll announce the date soon. Um, and then to help us to plan for future about college events and to be entered into a chance to win about college gift pack. Please complete our brief online survey by scanning this QR code. So this concludes our program today. We look forward to seeing you again in March.